Cool, let's start. Welcome to the Max Talks podcast with me, Max, and I'm once again joined by James and George. But today we have a very, very special guest with us, and he goes by the name of John Hartson. How are we, John? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. That's what we like to hear. Um, John, obviously, he played for the likes of Luton Town, Arsenal Football Club, West Ham, Wimbledon, Celtic, Wales as well. The list goes on. Um, I actually want to ask you a question straight off the bat, as we always do with a lot of our guests. Um, who were your footballing idols and growing up? Uh, well, well, obviously, I was born and bred in Swansea. Um, so I, I very much followed Swansea Football Club. Um, my dad would take me down the Vetch Field. Obviously, it's the Liberty Stadium now, but it used to be mm. the Vetch Field. And, um, and there used to be a fantastic atmosphere. I can remember Swansea were in the, the old First Division in 1981. And I was six years of age, born mm. in uh, 75. And um, my dad, my, my dad uh, has since said to me that he used to put me on his shoulders and, uh, and we used to watch the game, obviously, because the crowd would be so uh, large in the mm. North Bank in Swansea. I'm not too sure whether he could put me on his shoulders these days, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know that, that, that you know that seems like a good memory for me um, when John Toshak was in charge. So I had loads of I had loads of idols in that team, you know, the likes of Bob Blatchford and um, the likes Bob, of Bobby Bob James, Leighton James, Alan Curtis, and uh, yeah. all these uh, Swansea City legends and, and legendary footballers. But the team I supported uh, was Liverpool, simply because hey. of, um, it was Ian Rush, and yeah. uh, Rushy was Welsh, yeah. of course. He was the Wales, he was the Wales record goal scorer at the time. Obviously, Gareth Bale has, has since um, taken that record off him. Um, so that was that. That was where my liking for Liverpool came, just mm. in particular, just because of Rush. Um, he was a goal scorer. I loved scoring goals, you know, even as a kid, you know, for little junior teams, I was a centre forward that I just loved hitting the back of the net and things like that. So that's where my fondness for Liverpool came from. So I would probably have to say, if I had to say one, I would probably say Ian Rush. And then I got to train with him, with the national team. Um, but I never quite shared the pitch with him. Oh, no. actually came on for Rushy once against two. Oh, no. <laughs> I, think he retired. I think he retired not long after that. Oh, don't. Um, it's a gutter. So I can't say I shared a picture of them, obviously, lots of times in training and everything else. But I, I replaced him once, which yeah, that's the way it was. But it was Ian Rush. Ian Rush. That's what Amazing. Like. That's good. Um, when you say about being in the North Bank at Swansea Stadium like being on your dad's shoulders I'll never forget like when I was a kid going to watch Arsenal with my dad and just I could not see over everyone like I was so small obviously mm-hmm. I'd try and stand on the seats and then still couldn't see so all of a sudden I'm on his shoulders <laughs> they they do stick with you the memories don't they that's that's what yeah, I, they do and I just said got into football. I think it never leaves you I think I think Paul Scholes have said that you know his team is older you know, I, I think mm-hmm. Nicky Butt is a Rochdale supporter because they were born and, and bred in these places, raised and brought up, and although they went on to become Manchester United managers, I think most of us, our hometown, um, I think is very important for me because we didn't have the money. We didn't have the money to travel to these other big mm. first division grounds. Mm. You, you pretty much stayed at home and your mum would give you a pound and that would be enough for a bus fare into the city centre and, mm, yeah. you know, you'd end up then going with your mates. So, you know, that, that's where Swansea's always, you know, been very close to my heart as a football club and still is today. Um, but as I said, you know, one of the younger days, my dad had a van and um, he, had a, he had a big sort of, um, like, a, like a trailer thing on the back. And I can remember we used to play football about eight or nine, ten years of age, and he'd get off the team in the back of the truck. And, uh, <laughs> we'd kick off, I think it was, about half past two, and obviously the, the, the big teams, the Swansea were kicking off at three, and we'd all used to get in at half time for nothing. We could sneak into the North Bank for nothing, the doors oh, would be wide open. You know, and um, no, great days, fabulous days following Swansea on the North Bank. 
That's amazing. Amazing. That is so amazing. Obviously, you started off your career at Luton Town. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So when you eventually, so how many years did you spend there? Was it three seasons? It... Well, I, I, I started going to Luton when I was 10 years of age uh, on trials, oh, on, on okay. of, you know, the, the school holiday times. Um, my dad would take me down to the station. He'd, um, he'd give me a few spare coins, a few change he had in his pocket. And um, I'd go, I'd go on my own. I was only mm. 10, 11 years of age. And I would meet the likes of Kerry Hughes, um, Mark Pembridge. Mm. These guys lived in the Rhondda Valleys and I'd meet them in Cardiff. And then they'd literally look after me all the way up to Luton on the train. Yeah. I was very, very young. And, uh, and then obviously during the summer holidays, the Easter holidays, everything else, um, I'd go back and forth. And at 14, they, they offered me an, an apprenticeship. You know, the letter came through the door that they'd like to sign me as on a YTS scheme when I was 16. Um, I had several trials. I went to Leeds. Um, I, I trained with Cardiff City. That that wasn't very wise. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, there, there was there was other clubs as well, but it was Luton who first came in, and I enjoyed going to Luton. It was a really family, nice family environment. It was, um, it, it just felt right. You know, the digs they used to put me into to stay with other families during them little breaks. Um, I always had a fantastic time, you know, with these families, and and um, I just found loot, and it just it just it just seemed the right place for me to go. They had they had the the astroturf pitch um, where we could practice as 15, 14 mm. year old kids on the first <clears> team <throat> pitch, uh, which you could never yeah. do that now. You know, you no. could go to the likes of Anfield or Old Trafford or the Emirates, and there's big there's a big piece of um, wooden wood or something on the side of the please stay off the ground yeah. anywhere yeah, near, not yeah. anywhere near. Yeah. So if you can imagine I'm watching my heroes like Mick Harford and Ricky Hill and Brian Steen and all these guys scoring goals on the Saturday on Kenilworth Road mm. and on the Monday morning I'm, I'm literally on the same pitch you know practicing my free kicks um, and I, I love that side of it because me and a few of the youth team lads we used to spend hours hours and hours on, on, on the AstroTurf, on Kenilworth Road, just mimicking our heroes and just pretending to be Did serious. you uh, practice your celebrations? All, the all that sort of stuff, yeah. Um, so I loved Luton, and uh, I signed for Luton at 16. And um, it, was a, it was a brilliant um, sort of upbringing for me, really. Fantastic apprenticeship. Um, Back then, of course, it was we used to clean the boots. We used to be allocated mm. with, a, with a certain player that you would personally look after that player, make sure his kit is up on his peg in the morning, make sure his boots are gleaming clean when he's getting changed, look after everything, you know, get his towel, his dirty towel, stick it in the laundry basket afterwards, all these things, clean the stands, clean the dressing rooms. <laughs> This is what we used to do. Our the football's football changed now, yeah. yeah. On a Monday yeah. morning, you... we'd literally have a black bag each and go around the stand and we'd put all the, you know, all of the empty packets yeah. and the bottles of drink and everything. This is what we do, you know, and that, that was what it was like then. Obviously now, um, the, the... Do you end, think that they should still you know, do that, John? They don't do it now, no. I, I no, don't know do if they do, do you it think lower, it'd be good practice? Leagues. Sorry? Yeah. Do you think it'd be good practice to do that though? Because I think I think that you get too many complaints. Right. You get yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Get too many complaints. <laughs> I'm you know, being paid, paid three k to clean it up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my son has just been released at Swansea. Um, he was there since he was nine in the academy, and they released him a week before his um, his 16th birthday, which oh. was disappointing for him. And. Uh, you can't imagine him taking a bin bag in, into uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not a chance. He wants his Nando's for lunch, and he wants. <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty ruined in that now. They're, they're generally, a lot of them are spoilt. Um, but listen, it, it is what it is. But um, at that particular time, we didn't know any different. That, that was mm. part of our role as a, as a white on a um, youth training scheme, a YTS scheme, earning twenty nine pounds fifty a week. That, that's what that's what we were on. Um, mm. And then, of course, I played 50 times for Luton, made 50 appearances for Luton from the age of um, 19, uh, from the age of 
18 to 19. And then, of course, I, I got that big move to Arsenal. Mm. So that's yeah. what I would have definitely, because I'm an Arsenal fan and my yeah, dad was... You've already told me that four times. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but my, uh, my dad, he, <laughs> he, um, he always said about you, he always said, like, what he liked about you was that you were such a hard worker on the pitch. Um, and that's what he... And he, he couldn't really remember if he saw you on your debut or not um, at, at Highbury. Yeah. Because he's he's old, so he's losing it a little bit. But um, how? So when you got that move to Arsenal, how did that feel? Like, was you just gobsmacked? And yeah, well, there was actually a couple of clubs sniffing around at that particular time, and um, I was flying for Luton. I was 19 years of age, and um, I was I was full of energy. It's just I'd go through a brick wall. You know, I was very very aggressive, and I was on a lot of people's. You know, um, lips, a lot of clubs, lips, you know, John Hartson coming through at Luton. I think even now, the bigger clubs are always looking for the young players coming mm. through and, <clears throat> and and they're trying to nick them, aren't they? You know, Yeah, 100%. And, you know, rather than go and play £75 million for the top European striker, if you can go and get somebody who, who you can nurture and, and develop into something that can go on and sell in the future, then... That's generally what a club would prefer to do, but there's so much money in the game now that they'll just go and spend. You yeah. know, in City, if they want the best striker in the world, they've got the capacity mm. and the ability to go and get him. You know, and, and not just Man City have got money now, all the clubs have got money. Yeah. You know, with all the TV deals and everything else, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise you if Burnley went and got a £40 million pound striker. Yeah, it was only the top four, five, top two or three clubs that could do that, but they've all got money now. I think Swansea got relegated a couple of seasons ago. Swansea City from the Premier League, I think they got hundred eight million pounds. You know, yeah. to drop into crazy, the isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, at that particular time, I was, I was, um, I was of interest to quite a few clubs, and I think I didn't have an agent at the time. Mm -hmm very young um, and David Pleat who, who was my manager at Luton and I, and I think him and George Graham did the deal uh, basically oh. they just picked up the phone and said you know John 2.5 million pounds um, that was the fee and um, David Pleat said to me go home put a suit on have a shave <laughs> he said um, we're going to meet George Graham and I was like what? Wow like, oh. hell, yeah. from Luton across to you know, just by Holloway Road there, North London, and the yeah, Avenel Road, you know, uh, mm. the Highbury, was about 55 minutes or so, something like that. And I remember going with Mr. Pleat, my manager at the time, in the car, and, and his phone kept ringing all the time. He had one of these fancy cars with the phone in the middle of car it. Phone. Car and, phone. Uh, <laughs> it was just like different press and people getting wind of what was going on and he was like putting the phone down. So that was my first little bit of memories of even dealing with press if you like mm. how it all works and because it was quite big you know I was becoming Britain's most expensive teenager in the history of football and um, nobody had ever gone for that type of money as a teenager mm. and mm. I was joining Arsenal and um, they were under a little bit of pressure um, George Graham was only there for three or four weeks and then he got relieved of his job because mm. he took that ban off the Norwegian agent and everything else. So there's quite a lot of press around Arsenal at that time. How was it, what was it like being there when George Graham did get the sack? What was it like in the dressing room? Well, it, was, uh, it wasn't very nice. Obviously, not, not just for me, who George had just signed me and obviously put his trust in me. But it was for the other players, you know, you can imagine the likes of Tony Adams and mm. David Seaman to the England back four. Dixon, yeah. Adams, Keown, Bold, Winterbird, Merson, Wright, Parler, Jensen, all, all these guys, Smith, Campbell, all these other players. You know, George had, had won doubles with them. Yeah. You know, yeah. He won a lot of trophies mm. and he, he, he built up that personal relationship with them over, over, a, over a long period of time. So mm. I would imagine that, you know, some of the lads might have been delighted, um, yeah. you know, and other, other lads who, who played under George and, and obviously uh, won trophies with him. You know, that brings up camaraderie and that, that personal connection if you win something with a manager. So mm. I would imagine that a lot of the players uh, would have been upset to obviously see him go. It was almost like an end of an era, you know. Yeah. 
and um, and then from there the uh, Pat Rice and uh, and Stuart Houston took over, and the year that George um, yeah. was obviously left the club, uh, we got to the Cup Winners Cup final in Paris. Mm. We had a really good run in mm. Europe. Beat Sampdoria, beat Auxerre, we beat some really good teams. Went all the way to the final um, in Paris, and obviously we we got beat. That, that Naim goal wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the following summer, um, Bruce Rioch came in. I didn't particularly see eye to eye with Bruce, um, and uh, I found myself, you know, uh, out of the team on a few mm. occasions. A few occasions where me and Whitey played up top. And Dennis, uh, Bruce Rioch brought in Dennis Bergkamp, yeah, saying, yeah. seven and a half million pounds from, from Inter Milan, which was a great sign. And Dennis was an incredible player. And uh, there was times when me and Whitey played, and Dennis played in behind in the hole. But in general, I think I think uh, Bruce wanted to partner them two up. Uh, so I found myself a few times, you know, sitting out, and um, and I wanted to play. I was hungry to yeah. play. Twenty years of age. And I just wanted to play, irrespective of it, was Wrighty and, and Dennis Bergkamp, who were two of the finest in the world. Talent, yeah. Wrighty was even yeah. centre forward <clears throat> when I arrived at Arsenal. Um, and then what happened was uh, Arsene Wenger eventually came in. Bruce Rio got the sack, Arsene Wenger came in. And I, again, I had like a second wind. Uh, he really, mm. really wanted me to stay at the football club. He said to me, I want you to learn off Ian Wright and Dennis Bergkamp, John, these yeah. are two of the finest. I want you to stay and I want you to learn off these two guys. Um, but I wanted to play. Yeah. For my credit, I wanted to play. And I, I left Arsenal in 1997 and they won the double in 98. So what a good I know, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I, I, three years, I had three years left on my contract. You know, I signed a five year deal. I'd only been at the club two years. But um, I had Harry Redknapp on the phone, who was Harry's quite persistent, if you want to <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and, um, At his car window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, I think he said me out of his car window, actually, I'm only joking. Yeah. But, um, he said to me, he said, look, John, he said, we've got a good team. He said, we've mm. got good players here. He said, but we, we're just we're struggling to score goals. He said... Um, I'm going to pay record money for you. I've, I've, I've never spent the type of money that I'm going to spend on any player. I went to West Ham for 3.2 million. Mm. I broke their transfer record. Um, that's what I was for West Ham. <clears throat> and he, he brought myself, Paul Kitson, Stevie Lomas, Trevor Sinclair. He brought some fresh blood into Serious the... Serious players. He, he had some good players at West Ham at that time well, as well. Also, we had we had Monks, John Moncur, who was a fabulous, great little footballer. Uh, Ian Bishop. Um, we had a defence of Timmy Breaker, who I, who I knew from Luton. We had Dixie at left-back, Julian Dix. Um, mm. You know, centred off, we had Stevie Potts and, um, and Richard Hall, a big mm. sort of head on a yeah. stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We had Southampton. And uh, Al Berkovich, of course, who was a fabulous little Israeli midfield player, made mm. a lot of my goals, actually, although we had that training ground incident, yeah. <clears throat> which I regretted, <laughs> and I should never have reacted that way. That was that was a really big mistake yeah. of mine. I should never have reacted the way that I did, although he, hit, he threw the first punch. <laughs> <laughs> he deserved it. <laughs> James, what was it you said earlier about that? that I was going to say. What came out and said. I saw that Alan Berkowitz turned around and said, you know, if that had been a football, his head would have gone in the top corner. <laughs> I don't know who Alan Berkowitz is. Not Alan Berkowitz, sorry. Ayo Berkowitz. Ayo Berkowitz. Not Alan. Alan, Alan. Alan. Alan Berkowitz. Ayo Berkowitz. If I said that, you'd leave it in, because you yeah. said it. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it in, trust me. I'm, we're leaving that in. <laughs> Ayo no, Berkowitz. It was, um, no, it wasn't a very nice period because <clears> I'd been flying at the time. I got 24 goals for West Ham one season, which was my, my best in the Premier That was, you finished second, didn't you? In, uh, yeah, I was a goal. Course. I was a goal behind, I think it was Andy Cole or Michael Owen oh. or somebody. But I missed about five or six games as well through suspension mm. that year. I was just, just some daft sending off, really. But, you know, you look at it now and the one good thing, boys, about getting older is that you get a bit wiser, you mm. know. And, mm. uh, 
I only had one sending off at Celtic from the age of 26 to 31 in 230 games. I was sent off once. Um, so I certainly improved my disciplinary side of things. But when you're young, you're eager to make an impression. You do things and you, you know, I so much regret, but you, you don't think about things necessarily. You're a bit more hot headed and. Absolutely, wanna... 1 million percent. Yeah. Do you uh, think it's a lot of it's to do with you just want to impress? Yeah. By running around yeah. being like a I headless chicken right. at time I th- and then. I think, I think you're right because if we went behind, I would take it personally and mm. I'd want to go and kick someone or yeah. on someone or something like that rather than just wait and see how things develop. I wanted to go and make an impression. You know, just reinvent the wheel, if you like. It was crazy <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, but looking at looking back, um, you know, I, I've always said I've not got many regrets, if any regrets. I think we all do things and we act the way we do at that particular time because we think it's the way, the right way mm-hmm. to do it. But I, I definitely um, regretted that incident with Io because we actually got on really well. There was yeah. no dislike for each other. We were fine. Mm. He was setting up my goals. And he was a brilliant player. Mm. You know, he was, he was an absolute brilliant player. Um, just guile and the weight to pass, you know. He, he was just so silky, I was. And um, he really was a, a, a fabulous player. I made a lot of my goals as well. If you look at the goals that I scored, I think I got 33 goals in all for West Ham. Um, he, he must make a load of them for me, you know, very yeah. selfish. And if he's if he's one on one with the goalkeeper and the keeper comes out, he doesn't want to slot it and score. He, he just play you in. He'll look for you. Quite yeah. happy, yeah. Mm-hmm. Take that assist very, bonus and then a selfless <laughs> player. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And now uh, you know what happened w- was wrong, and somebody had a mobile phone on the side of the pitch. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I wouldn't go into what happens at Wimbledon training sessions. No. If the camera's there, then it would go <laughs> <Jesus. laughs> The crazy game. But, uh, not trying to take any pressure off myself in terms of what happened, but um, you know, I, I shouldn't have reacted that way. It was the wrong reaction. I apologise. I took the fine. I took the, the suspension. I took all the bad publicity. Mm. I took all the negative stuff um, on the chin. I dealt with it. I held my hand up. That was it. And I've got to move on from this. And as I said, um, that's the way I felt at the time. I need to move on. I need to get back in the team. And, and that's exactly what happened. But do you think well, making that mistake, that decision to do that, changed your mentality on the game, changed you as a person? Changed, you know I think it changed the West Ham's so, so, supporters' sort of um, trust in me, if you like, and mm. support for me because... Um, I'd always felt that whatever I've gone since then, um, you know, it's always gone before me. Mm. You know, like I went to I went to Wimbledon for seven point five million in nineteen ninety nine from yeah. West Ham. <clears throat> you know, that's twenty one years ago. That's hundred million today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Is, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Celtic for six. You know, um, mm. and I always felt when people spoke about. John Hartson, um, they went, oh yeah, John gets a few goals, yeah, good in the air, a decent fit for a big man, you know, good in the dress, you know, good character. But did you see that? Did you mm. see that? It's just always there, isn't and it? People go, oh, and I always felt I had, I had to sort of win people over again, do you know? Mm. Um, and it's all my own fault, I'm not blaming anybody else, it's just the way that it was. And um, but that was an, you know, an unsavoury incident, really. <clears throat> Which, which shouldn't really, um, I shouldn't really, it, it is a dampener on what, what happened, but I had such a great sort of, you know, 20 months at West Ham. Yeah. And it's almost like, I always say this, boys, and you can remember this, can you, you, you should think about this because you're doing podcasts and you're doing media stuff, which is great. You can almost take a career to build up a reputation, right? to build up your profile. It can take you years and years and years and you could ruin it in three seconds. Like yeah. 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 Just spot and, on. Yeah. And you're gone. You're <laughs> out. No way back. Mm. So I think nowadays in particular more than any other, you know, um, 
and it's in, in a way uh, people have to be seen to, to 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 say the right things and do the right things. Of course, because we all believe in the equality and everything else, that's absolutely right. Um, but you can also um, make the odd mistake and maybe say something and thing, and all of a sudden, well, you, yeah, yeah, it's everywhere. You know, all of the newspapers, you're not just back page or maybe your front page. And that's what mm. happened to me. I took this career, you know, everything else. And people still bring it up. People still, I bring it up myself more than yeah. I. <laughs> you know? mm. So that was that. Buffalo. So obviously you moved on to Celtic and um, George, oh. you actually wanted to ask a few questions. Yeah, because uh, as you said, you, you signed for six million. And, you know, this Celtic team had both Sutton and Larson in it. What was it, what was it like playing with those players and, like, breaking into that team? Was there, like, a real competitive atmosphere there? <clears throat> well, first of all, when I, when I joined Celtic, um, Celtic had just won the treble for the first time in 40 years. Oh, and, no word. Uh, no pressure. Henrik, Henrik Larson and Chris <laughs> Sutton. I'd scored 66 goals between them. That's just <laughs> crazy, <laughs> isn't it? During that treble winning season. March yeah. O'Neill's first season. And um, they won the treble. So Martin takes me to the club exactly a year later. And I've got to, I've got to get in the team. And in all fairness to Chris Sutton and his professionalism, <laughs> and um, he basically moved back into midfield or centre half, and he'd won a golden boot as a centre forward. He formed a magnificent partnership with Alan Shearer at Blackburn, uh, mm. two great foil for Alan, and uh, he was a great centre forward in his own right. Went to Chelsea for ten million. Okay, didn't quite work as as well as he would have liked to have it would have it to have worked. Viali paid ten million pounds for Chris Sutton when he <coughs> went to Chelsea. Um, so. The only way I'm really going to get into the team is is by Chris respecting me and my game and saying, look, with the three of us in the team, we're stronger rather than any two, you know. Yeah. And he was so versatile, big Sutty, you know, he could play in midfield, he could play off the front, he could play centre half. Um, he had a great engine, he read the game superbly well. Um, great in the air, brilliant feet, could score goals. He, he had everything. Really. He was a top-class footballer, Chris Sutton was. And um, and he moved out of his favourite position. Favorite position, yeah. position yeah, yeah. To allow me to get into the team. And over the next sort of five years, I went on and scored 110 goals for Celtic. And yeah. we scored 446 goals between us. Hearts and Mars. That's, mental, isn't it? <laughs> for That's mental. What a trio. Yeah, so we, we hit it off and um, we were a big threat, obviously, from set pieces and, and in general play. And um, it was Alex a great club, you know, it's, uh, it's an institution of a club, really. And of all the clubs I played for, um, every, every supporter will obviously believe in their own football club. But in terms of fan base and everywhere I go today, whether it's on holiday to Bermuda or Florida or Disney or Paris or whatever, or even if I go to a caravan park in South Wales, mm. Mm. I can't fail but bump into a Celtic fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, everywhere. they're everywhere. They are. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. Got, we played We've Coupe got... Yard in a pre-season friendly uh, when I was there. There were 17,000 and there's 15,000 Celtic fans there and 10,000 outside the ground. Just that's that's, that's sad. They fans live in London, you know. Yeah. Rangers as well. Rangers as well are the same. Rangers are, are a massive club. Um, yeah. Massively supported club. So the two hugely supported clubs um, within their own right, you know. But uh, I had a wonderful five years at Celtic. I, I won three titles. Um, uh, got a Scottish Cup, League Cup. I won the Football Writers Player of the Year. I won the Players Player of the Year. And it was a brilliant, brilliant five years for me. Yeah. <clears throat> I nearly went to Middlesbrough with Steve McLaren. Um, 
think I dodged a bullet on that one. Yeah, I think, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I think you did. I think well, you well, did. Well, I'm only joking. I like that. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously a really good club struggling at the minute. Neil Warnock's gone in there to try and... There's some great players at Middlesbrough. Few yeah, seasons, quite a few seasons back. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Yeah, you, you obviously got to play with uh, Janino, who yeah. was obviously at Middlesbrough as well. Um, what yeah. was he like? Brilliant, really nice lad, very humble, quiet. Um, I watched him at Middlesbrough when he first arrived, and he was just like a little genius, wasn't he? Mm. He was just mm-hmm. incredible. And, and, and if this is not a criticism at all of him, really, but he wasn't that Janino that I saw at Middlesbrough. That's the best way I can say it. Mm. Um, he was still a good player, but he never came and set the world alight, if you like. Mm. He took the number seven shirt from Henrik Larsson, which was always going to be pressure, even That's though he was Janino. And you just won a World Cup in, um, for Brazil just before arriving at Celtic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know whether he had long enough at the club maybe to settle in and to prove how good he really, really was. I think most of the players were looking at him thinking, oh, Janinho, this guy's magnificent. You know, all the clips we'd seen of him and tearing up the Premier League and everything else, which he did at Middlesbrough. Um, I don't think you then, to say it in a, in a nicer way, he didn't hit the heights, if you like, at Celtic, the money mm. that he previously done uh, under Brian Robson when, when Robbo took him into Middlesbrough. Um, but he was great to play with, you know, great stories and, you know, telling us about, you know, the, some of the brilliant players over the years that he played with. And he was really infectious. He was talking with the lads and everything else. And, um but uh, no, as I said, I, I enjoyed playing with him, uh, Janino, and I played with some great players, you know, the likes of Petrov, Paul Lambert, the European mm. winner, European yeah. Cup winner with Dortmund, um, a lad called Lubo, Lubo Moravchik. I don't know if you know much about Lubo, but he was yeah. incredible. Um, and of course, Henrik and Lenny and Tomo and all these guys. We just had a great dressing room. And of course, Martin O'Neill was our gaffer. Yeah. For a period of time. So, you, you uh, uh, there's one one other player that I want to ask about at Celtic, and he, he wasn't there for a long time. But Sir Alex Ferguson has binned off his captain basically, and uh, he's floating around in January. You know, Roy Keane's said a few things. He's come up to Celtic. What was what was Roy Keane like for that half a season that he came up? Um, what was playing with him like? Well, I played with I played against Roy several times for <clears throat> um, Arsenal, Wimbledon, uh, Premier League teams, Coventry that I played for. Yeah. Um, and Roy was a beast of a player, really beast of a player, fearless, um, never give the ball away. Um, great captain. I think when you listen to some of the United players now talk about Roy and his standards, his discipline and his, um, the way you go about your training and um, your day-to-day life when you're, mm. when you, when you're, when you're the captain of a club the size of Manchester United. And when he arrived, um, he was great. We, quite, I saw that side of Roy, that snappy side that people spoke about in the dressing room and snapping. Up. Never really did that um, at Celtic. I don't know whether he was 34, 35, um, he had a testimonial coming up at the end of the year. Mm. There were 67,000 people at Old Trafford. I remember Roy played the first half for Celtic and he played the second half for Man United. Mm. And, I, and I said to him after the game, I said, Roy, I said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, why are you tiring? <laughs> I said, you're the best player on the pitch. You know, he <laughs> all the way all night, he was unbelievable. And he said that he needed a new hip or a couple of new hips because his, his hips had gone and mm. prevented mm. him making them lung busting runs. Yeah, into yeah. Box. He used to make so much. And he changed his position a bit, didn't he? He, he went a little bit deeper. Deeper, and he, he yeah, yeah. More of like a, they call it quarterback role, didn't they, when they sit yeah. mm. <clears throat> uh, But he was great. He, he was good as gold. Um, I think the first game, his, his debut was against Clyde. In the in the Scottish Cup, and unfortunately, we we just didn't turn up. We had a great team that day, um, out on the pitch, no excuses, and uh, and we got beat two 0 
to Clyde. Graham Roberts is Clyde, and Graham was an ex Rangers player as well. Ex- oh, you yeah. love that. Oh. And, um, and I think Roy got on the bus afterwards, and I think he, he claimed that he, th- he didn't think anything could get any worse. And then he looked over and he saw John Hart snubbing a can of Coke and a, and a bag of crisps or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> what he didn't realise, that was my third can of Coke. And my yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, oh, it was, oh, uh, he, was, he was all right, Roy. And, I, you know, I've been in his company a little bit uh, since then as well. And uh, mm. no, he's absolutely fine. I, I like him. I like his, uh, I like his, you know, the way he, Goes about his plan. Yeah. He doesn't leave anybody off with anything. Does he? Oh no, he doesn't. No, I, I, I listened to a uh, Ian. It was a right. He he spoke about uh, Roy Keane. I think it was in some interview, and I think it might have been on the Match of the Day podcast. So he said about when it was. I think it was the World Cup. He said to Roy, "He was like, we'll meet for breakfast in the morning about eleven o'clock." Right, he turns up at eleven o one, and he's like looking around for Keane, and he's thinking, "Where the fuck is he?" So he calls him up. He's like, Roy, where are you? He's like, you said 11 o'clock. You was not there at 11, so I've gone home. And he was like, no, but he was like, Roy, Roy, come on. He was like, no, righty. And then just like hung up the phone. And that's, I, don't I, think mind that's, that. I, I don't mind that. That's like kind of his, that was Roy Keane to a T, really, wasn't I it? I hate lateness. I can't have lateness. My wife's late all the time. Me and my wife argue. Before we even have our first drink on a night out because she's late yeah. getting ready. <laughs> I, know women, I know women get ready and everything else, and, but I'm sitting in the taxi and I'm saying to the taxi driver, don't ask me where she is, mate. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, no, I get that. I get that. Some people, you know, Martin O'Neill would, would leave you in the hotel if you were late. Leave yeah. You ground without you, and you'd have to get a taxi, make your own way. Some people are like that. Some people think it's disrespectful. I think lateness sometimes can creep into your life. You know, one minute if you're late for something, you'd be late for something else. You think you can get away with it? And... Oh, it's okay. If you've got to be there three o'clock, leave at half past, uh, half past two. Yeah. Don't leave at five to three. Leave at <laughs> yeah. half past two. Be early. You, to. you know, be early. I know it's a petty sometimes thing, but some people are quite... You know, really, really just in the, the the way the way they do things. You know, um, if it's three o'clock, it's three o'clock. Well, I think he's you, just you a true professional, on, isn't he? On the pitch, three minutes past three, would you? No, no. You know, you, you'd be on there doing your warm up and everything else. But I, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. Mm. Yeah. It just shows how much of a true professional he is, I guess. Yeah, that story with Wrighty, he, he um, takes it into his a good story, actual life. Yeah. yeah. Go on, James. Oh yeah, oh, sorry, I was going to ask John, you know in that time where it was obviously you, Henrik and Chris in that front three, obviously nowadays there's sort of a bigger gulf when you look at Celtic and Rangers versus the top four in the Premier League, for example, money-wise. Did you feel that you could literally be anyone on your day, even in Europe? Back in that day, back in, in that team we had, yes. Yeah, mm. we had outstanding players, and um, we got to the UEFA Cup final, beating Liverpool and Blackburn yeah. along the way, and um, we had, we eventually lost to Jose Mourinho's Porto in Seville. Um, I missed that game because of a back operation. I'd been flying that year. I would I would have played in that final if I hadn't had a back injury. I had two two discs are taken out of my back, mm. so that was disappointing on a personal level, but. Going back to your question, we were at a tremendous team and uh, we beat Man United, albeit it was testimonials and things like this. 4-3, I think, Celtic beat Man United at United in a, in a Ryan Giggs. I'm not saying that um, Celtic beat Manchester United at Celtic Park, a Nakamura free kick. Um, what man? I think Boric saved... Uh, um, a Louis Saha penalty later on. We beat them all. We beat yeah. Juventus. Yeah. We beat AC Milan. We beat um, Shakhtar Donetsk. We beat Porto. Um, we went to places like Bayern Munich, and we went. You know, we we just had an outstanding team. Martin had formed this team. It was full of internationals. Um, everybody knew their roles and responsibilities. We didn't carry anybody. 
Um, and if you played well, you played the next game. If you didn't yeah. play well, then Martin would look to maybe change it. But nowadays, you see you see teams a lot. They they um, they change all the time, don't they? Three, four, five changes every game. Okay, they've got the capacity to do that now because the squads are big. But I can't remember if being at Celtic and making more than one or two changes. Yeah. Uh, the team played well. We believed in that momentum, that consistency, and Martin would generally stick with it uh, yeah. unless somebody specifically asked for a rest or unless they said that they're carrying a certain injury. You would literally stay in the team and you'd be happy to stay in the team. If I'd scored on the week before, I want to get my goal tally up. I want to finish my career and say, well, I had so many goals in so many games. And Hendrik was the same. Chris was the same. Yeah. Um, but basically, if uh, if you'd scored one week and you'd won, then the team wouldn't change. The team wouldn't change. So the answer to your question is, yeah, I really do feel, and it's, I'm taking my Celtic hat off and being, um, obviously, I'm very loyal to my ex-teammates and that particular team. Um, but I genuinely feel if we could have beaten anybody hmm. on our day, with the amount of experience and the talent and um, that team spirit that we had, that particular side, I, I do genuinely believe we could have beaten anybody on our day. Yeah. That's cracking. Thank you. That's good. All right, mate. Um, James, you want to move on to the... Oh. John being at... Oh, yes. The pundit um, tree. The pundit tree <laughs> side. So, yeah, John, I mean, the first question I was going to ask you is, did you ever think about going into management after you finished your career? Yeah, I went straight down to Aberystwyth <clears throat> to do my, um, my coaching badges. And um, I did my um, C licence, uh, which is one week, my UEFA C licence. Mm. Then I did my B, and then I spent a week down in Aberystwyth um, with Roberto Martinez um, doing my wow. A licence. Wow. And, um, Robert Page was on that particular um, license. Matthew Jones who used to play for Wales and Leicester. Matt was a good player. Um, several ex-players and things like that. And um, I got my A license and then I became ill. Mm. In 2009, I had testicular cancer that spread to my lungs and onto my brain and left a few scars and things like that. And I didn't think I was going to make it, and I was extremely ill. You know, I had um, two emergency brain operations. I had an operation on my, my tracheotomy. I had two operations on my lungs. And then when I came out of the hospital, I had about 50, 60 sessions of chemotherapy. And mm. at one stage, it looked very bleak. It looked yeah. as if it wasn't going to come through. You know, I was in desperate trouble at one stage. And through the grace of God and that little bit of luck that we all need in life, I, um, I managed to come through that horrible period of my life. And um, so during that time, I got my A license. I became ill, which put me out for about nine or ten months. And while I was coming back to full health, um, I got an offer from Satanta Television. Mm. Remember, Satanta. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. 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 Coming to the Scottish League with, um, with Terry Butcher. And oh, it was wow. me and Terry. We were both doing the the SPL, the Scottish Premier League at the time. Mm. Um, and I really enjoyed the media. I really enjoyed it. I thought just, you know, learning about it and um, learning about different sort of systems and tactics and how you, the approach to it all. And, and obviously there's pressure because you're live on television. Mm. You know, there's always sure. a little bit of pressure because... You can get it right 19 times out of 20. Nobody says, well done. But you get Nobody's it wrong. Time. <laughs> you might get a name wrong. Like Alan Burbitch. Somebody from <laughs> name wrong. And your Twitter's... Yeah. Get yeah. hammered. See, that's why I feel sorry for Paul Merson. Mercer's not bothered though. Mercer's not bothered. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I love Merson. He's he's yeah, great. He's, he's a great lad. Mm. But um, no, there's pressure, of course, um, to deliver, especially more so now than ever. I think with social media, and um, 
there's so much negativity uh, around it that signs, you know, sometimes it maybe stops people from going into it. I think if you've got if, if, if you've got a little bit of anxiety, if you're a little bit nervy about things, or you worry what people think about you or what you say or what you do, then don't bother. Mm, you've, yeah. got to, you've got to have yeah. thick skin and you've got to be able to make the odd mistake. Who doesn't get a name wrong? You That's know, it, as long yeah. as you're a producer and as long as the, the guys and the editors of, of the show, as long as they are seeing that you're doing a good job, you do your prep, you go in, you're early, you're professional, and you do the best that you can possibly do and you describe situations as well as you can and um, you know you, you spend that amount of time in front of the screen sometimes you know short is more mm. you know, get in make your point and get out you haven't got to make it three times type of thing or, yeah. um, <clears throat> so it's, it's all about learning I've been doing the media now for 10 or 11 years um, I've done all the big shows if you like BBC I've done the Euros the radio the comms and Five Live and mm. Uh, BT Sports, Sky, all these ga- all these gigs. So I've been lucky. I've been lucky with the media. Um, not all of us can talk, lads. When you get a week, I'll teach you. To, I'll teach you how to talk properly when you get a week off. But I'll take you to teach you oh, how to talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please do. Please do. Please do. <laughs> no, but I still think I still think you're learning, and I'm always looking at um, how how people. Um, like last night, even I was watching Sky, and I thought Ashley Cole came across really well mm. when he was talking about Kieran Tini, a player that I know really well. Obviously, watched him at Celtic. I live up here now in Edinburgh, so I'm closer to all the Scottish, um, the SPFL, and everything else, the Scottish Premiership. And um, you know, coming from Ashley, you Ashley used to clean my boots at Arsenal, believe it or not. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, wow. Yeah, so coming from Ashley, who was a, a proper world-class left-back, mm-hmm. um, could go forward, could defend, played in a, a brilliant team, a couple of brilliant teams, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. Um, Chelsea, Arsenal, England, magnificent, and then obviously onto Roma then from there. Um, but the way he was talking about Kieran, the way he was saying he uses the ball very well, he doesn't like to get beat, he doesn't like to allow no. crosses in. That, that, that's what defenders should do. And what I liked yeah. as well about Tierney yesterday, especially was there was a point, I know we ended up conceding, but there was a point where I think it was just after Nketiah got the red card, he just hoofed the ball up the pitch. It was kind of, we was dilly-dallying with it quite a lot and he just wanted to get it out. And that's what yeah. I like to see sometimes when you're in yeah. trouble, just stick your foot through it. And yeah. actually, Cole he's, he's, a proper player. Out, he's, yeah. he's a proper player for one so young still. You know, he's played a lot of Champions League at Celtic. He's mm. won trophies and under Brendan Rodgers, obviously, when Brendan was there. And I think he, 123 appearances he's made, Kieran, already. Um, yeah. And he will go on. He start at Arsenal. He, you know, he, he had a couple of, probably still growing maybe, you know, he's mm. still very young and a couple of injuries that he, he had to get over. But, when he when he's flying and when he's up and down that left hand side, he can defend. He can go forward. He's got great engine. He's quick. He's aggressive. Great delivery. You see his crosses into the box with care, and he's trying to pick people out on that left hand side. You know, um, so he will be a magnificent signing for Arsenal, and I'm anticipating him. You know, cap anticipating him being captain at some stage in the future. Yeah, I could see that. And leading lead by example because he's still very young, but he's got them leadership qualities about him, Kieran. and I really feel that. Yeah, Scotland can... are very blessed with fullbacks at the moment. Aren't oh, hundred percent. Oh, yeah. Well, you'd Bob have to play them both, wouldn't you? You'd have to play. Oh. You'd have to play Robertson at, at left back, and then Kieran either either down that left hand side, or or left side centre back. Mm. But you, you couldn't have one of them setting out with, with the talent that they've got. And I remember Terry Horace did that for Wales once. He had, um, he had Dean Saunders, Ian Rush and Mark Hughes. Um, can you imagine mm. having them three in this game? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it. Having the oh, option no. of, of playing them three. So what Terry did, he played them all. And, and what, the way that he looked at it was, I need to get my best 11 players in one team. I need to find a system that works. I cannot leave, you know, my twenty-goal striker out at Liverpool. I can't. I can't leave the Bayern Munich and Manchester United striker out in Mark Hughes. You know, and no way. Um, no. So what he did was he played Rush. He played Rush and 
and Saunders uh, through the middle. And he played Mark, Mark Hughes in centre of midfield. Yeah. Uh, he loved the tackle and everything, man. He was great on the ball as well. And obviously, Giggsy went up left hand side, left wing. Um, so, you know, sometimes you've got to just get your best players into a system yeah. because they know they're intelligent footballers and generally good footballers, no matter where they play, will do the right <clears> thing. <throat> That's what you expect from your footballers. Top level footballers make the right pass with the right weight. They make the right decision at the crucial stages because they're yeah. very good footballers and you can't really afford to leave one of them out of the team. Mm. Yeah. Get them in. Find a way to get them all in. And I that's think that's what, uh, that's what Steve Clark would have to do with Scotland, with Robertson and, and Tini. Yeah, he's got a big job ahead of him, Steve Clark, isn't he? Yeah. It'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see how they kick on. Um, I was going to ask John as well. Obviously, during your professional career, you have your partnership and you have who you, who you like to play with. At BT, are there any sort of pundits you really enjoy working with? Yeah, I, I, I like, um, I, I looked up to Alan, Alan Shearer a lot, because Alan was a centre forward, great centre forward. Um, I think he's England's greatest ever centre forward, personally. Um, the goals he scored, freakish, really. Um, I think he scored... 30 Premier League goals a season. Um, Premier League goals. Yeah, it's crazy, it's ridiculous. For three, for three consecutive seasons, I think it was. Mm. Um, Stupid. Just, just a phenomenal striker of the ball. Um, great in the air. Not the tallest, but a wonderful leap. And he just had a ridiculous desire to mm. get across people, you know. Um, and I like Alan, uh, you know, as a person, I like him. And um, he's, he's, a, he's a real man. You know, he's a man amongst men. That's a bit, bit similar to Tony Adams, you know, yeah. no messing. He's a man, you know. Um, and what Tony's gone on and done, you know, with, it, with his um, sporting chance clinic is incredible. Yeah, work. He's helped over the years. Obviously, and obviously having to help himself. I think Tony's 25 years or something now without a drink. I was actually mm. there on the day. He came out and admitted he was an alcoholic on the Arsenal training ground, and um, we all respected him. And he said, "Look, I'm going to need, I'm going to need your help, you know." Mm. Um, and we all we respected Tony. We all looked up to him anyway as as, as our captain. Um, I like working with Alan. Uh, who else do I like? Um, uh, let's have a look. Who else do I like working with? I like working with Tim Sherwood. I've done some BT Sport mm. with Tim. Mm. Tim is always very relaxed in the, yeah, in the yeah. studio. Tim, you know, nothing flusters him. He speaks ever so well. He's educated. Um, he, can, he was telling me that he used to have Harry Kane, you know, as part of the reserves at Spurs. And mm -hmm. Harry would take him, Harry Redknapp would take Tim and play, you know, a sort of take Harry, Harry Redknapp would take Harry Kane off Tim Sherwood in the reserves and put him amongst the first team. And then Harry sent him out on loan three or four times uh, when Harry had him. And then eventually, uh, Harry Kane became, became the player that he, that he was. Yeah. Tim, yeah. Tim Sherwood likes to take the credit for that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> so, well, there's loads of them. I don't want to go on too much because there's, there's a few I don't uh, particularly like working mm. with. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you don't have to mention them. <laughs> I've got only to hang people out, lads. You know. Yeah, oh, that's uh, cracking. Thank you um, very much for that, John. So, so John, obviously, so with me, I I used to work at a bookies um, about a year ago, and you know, from the age of eighteen, I you know I liked a little flatter every now and then, and that's like slowly started to grow into every day, five pound here, five pound there. And then um, when I actually eventually started working at the bookies, it just got out of hand. Like I became uh, crazy with the gambling. And obviously I've, I've read that you also had a gambling problem a few years back. Um, when did you come to terms with, oh, when did you come to terms that you had a problem? Well, um, I'm glad you brought this up, actually. And uh, I, I never really come to terms with it because I never thought I had a problem. And that's, mm. that's, what, addicts, that's what addicts are like. Um, they blame everybody else yeah. without really 
delving in too much into what what the issue is, you know. Um, and it was nine. It was nearly nine years ago, and I'm not a bet for nine years. Yeah. And, um, I've been clean. I go to GA. I'm a I'm a responsible gambling um, uh, ambassador for Ladbrokes. Mm. I go and I do different talks, and I remind people of their responsibilities. Um, not that they, if they don't want to listen to me, that, that that's their prerogative. Yeah. Um, because not everybody who gambles is an addict. I think it's very important to to, to say that. Um, some people can have a bet once every couple of months. Some people will be betting all the time and telling a load of lies to themselves yeah. and to the oh, family don't. and everything else. And what you've got to remember is, is that compulsive gamblers like myself and gambling addicts, we're compulsive liars as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When we're gambling, we're not, we're not, um, we're very deceitful uh, because of this addiction. You know, you're not, and addictions are very, very difficult to break down. Mm. Very, very difficult to beat. If you're ad- if you're addicted to something, it's extremely hard mm. to get away from that. That's why you have meetings, and that's why you have practitioners and therapists and people that you can go and see yeah. to break it all down. I I used GA Gamblers Anonymous, <clears throat> and um, it's been magnificent for me. It saved my life getting clean. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be with my wife now. I wouldn't have the relationship I've got with my kids now mm. if I continued to gamble. I wouldn't be able to focus in, and I'd be every twenty minutes. I'd be oh, you, you're on your phone and all the time. Bet on now, you know, there's no way we could have had this. I wouldn't have been clear in my head as what I am now. Um, so, what, what, once, once I hit rock bottom, that was that was the, the bottom line. My wife said that she would. Uh, she packed her bags and she she was leaving me and uh, and I broke down. I broke down in 2011, October the 5th, my mother's birthday. Mm. And um, October the 5th this year, I'll be nine years clean. That's, That's brilliant. Incredible. Fantastic. Yeah. That's brilliant. I, I, I've, I've been, um, I've got, I've got to say it's, uh, it's, it's, it's taken work. It's taken work and it's taken commitment and um, listening, a lot of listening to people and listening to stories and going to GA and, and helping the newcomers <clears throat> yeah. come in. That, that's what inspires me as well. The fact that they trust me now to help them. Whereas mm. I'd have said to a gambler 10 years ago, you know, I wouldn't have known where to start. I'd have asked him, why is he thinking of st- you know, all this sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, so that's really important that now I continue to go and continue with my recovery. And uh, I'm in a great place now. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm in a great place um, mentally because of the, you know, what, what the gambling does to you. Um, uh, it you takes know. over your life completely. Like I would be sitting there down the pub with my mates or whatever. And instead of watching the game, I'm watching the bets on my phone or mm. something like that. And you just end up, Come, you you go into like a betting reality like you there's nothing else around you you're just staring at your phone or you know i used to come out as you say about compulsive liars i'd come out and say i've only had one bet yeah. but i've got 10 bet slips in my pocket <clears throat> we know we we know because we're gamblers We've, mm. well i'm a former gambler i don't know what your situation I've is not now. had one now since i think it was the 8th of march Oh, well done. We'll keep so, that going. Yeah. Keep that. Do you go to meetings? Or? No, no. I've just five years self-exclusion on all the apps. Good. So I've got well no done. apps, nothing well like done. that. Yeah. Well, everybody finds their own way. You know, a lot of people don't like GA. A lot of people find it a hassle to go to GA. But the one thing I always think is, you know, what, what's two hours out of your week? Mm. You know, if, you're, if you can go listen to other people's stories, get some feedback, you know, get some, educate yourself really on getting clean and uh, what you have to do. It's a fellowship. You know, you don't like to let the person next to you down, mm-hmm. things like this. And mm-hmm. you're absolutely right what you say about it takes over every second of every day, of every mm-hmm. hour, of every week. It's on, it's the forefront thing on your mind when you wake up in the morning, yeah. the last thing at night. And how are you meant to have a relationship like that? How are you meant yeah. to... 
you know, show your wife that you care and love her and, you know, your children are running around, especially in this pandemic. They reckon the online gambling has gone up uh, yeah, yeah. so much during this particular time. Yeah. Um, and these are not bad people. They, no. they got into a rut and it's like, it's like being an alcoholic, you know, and um, alcoholics will sleep with a bottle of vodka under their pillow and they'll tell mm. their wife that not a drink in three months. You know, yeah. it, it, it's very, it's very difficult. You know, you know. Um, but you're right; it takes over your every move, every decision, every move. Yeah. And it's hard to get away from that. But when you do get away from it, the world is is a much better. And oh, you, you do know. I definitely notice a big change in uh, just yeah. the way I act, the way I go about my life now. It's completely different. I can actually sit there and watch a game of football yeah. and enjoy and it. Enjoy it. Yeah, oh, good for you. Yeah, it's, it's not easy, by the way. So give yourself a pat on the back because mm. it's it's really not easy when you when you've been in a in a situation where you're gambling all the time and it's like second nature to you and it, it's not easy. People think it's easy because they've never gambled, they've never been there. With me, I gambled every day in my life for fifteen years. Every day, um, you know, people would say about about betting on on a cricket match. I'd have forty bets on a cricket match. You know, because you can mm. bet in running and things like yeah. this. You know, every other ball, in every over, you can gamble on, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm away from that. That is yeah. something that, um, that I'm, I'm obviously very pleased about, that uh, I no longer gamble and I no longer, um, I no longer have to go around telling lies and, and, and ducking and diving. And, yeah. You know, putting all my money away to these people and all this and... Um, you know, I can save my money now and I can get things and we can go on nice holidays as a family together, yeah. not worry about things like that, which should have been, you know, I, I had nice holidays and I had things because I was earning a lot of money. But um, the last nine years has, has, has been has been fantastic for me while I've been clean because I've almost sort of reinvented my life um, around being clean, you know? That's brilliant, John. Yeah. Love to hear that, mate. Good. Could I just ask, while we're on the subject of gambling and addiction, um, do you think that sometimes uh, a lot of ex-footballers come out and say, you know, they've struggled with either alcohol addiction, gambling addictions, any sort like drug addiction, stuff like that. Do you think because they've left football and that's almost an addiction in itself for their career, say it's a 15 to 20 year career, they've had that addiction to football. Do you think they're more susceptible to these outside sources like gambling and, and, um, and maybe alcohol? Uh, possibly, uh, possibly. I think we've seen experiences of it, haven't we, with footballers finishing their mm. careers? Um, you know, no, no money coming in, not the same lifestyle. Divorce is big, you know, because as a family, you're used to a certain lifestyle. You, you know, the wives and the kids are used to certain, certain to, they're used to certain holidays every year. And yeah. all of a sudden, that all stops. And that all stops. The money doesn't come in. You're not fortunate enough to be, uh, you're not taking your coaching badges. You're not a manager. Uh, you're not working on the television. And the money stops coming in. You have to downsize your house. This is happening all the time to footballers, especially in the lower leagues. So I, I would think there's, there's, there's an element of um, turning then to drink or turning to drugs or turning to, to gambling. I would imagine that th th there would be instances where, where players have done that. Um, yeah. You know, maybe it's, it's because of that shock at, 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 at finishing, you know, and, and, and it does literally, it means stop. You know, uh, unless you're fortunate enough to go onto the coaching ranks, so you've got a good relationship with the staff at the football <clears> club or the management, or and they take you on board, like some players actually do get that little bit of luck, and they do get that up little opportunity. Of course, you've got to want to do it as well, and you've got to be good at it. But my career literally stopped, stopped in its tracks. It's at West Brom and on loan at Norwich. Um, and it stopped, so I'm, I'm all of a sudden one day from training to at home, and mm. it's like, what do I do now? All I've ever done, and I was gambling, you know, and I was drinking, and um, 
the money stops coming in. Yes, you've got some spares, but it, it doesn't last forever, you know. No. So I, I can see your your your, your point. You, you know your um, uh, your valid point, really. Yes, I would imagine that does happen, and it's a shame. I think the one thing maybe from this from this interview is you can take as well is if there are any footballers watching uh, or will watch this then it's, it's, it's very important maybe if you're not earning the high end bracket where you can have enough money where you can save and look after yourself the rest of your life if you're only playing in the League 1 or League 2 or I think it's important to have something to fall back on Yeah, you know yeah. Um, maybe maybe something that a business or um, you know a trade or because it's all going to end at some stage. It's all going to mm. end. Your career is going to finish at some stage, and you don't want to be in the position that many footballers are in now, where they've got nothing to fall back on, and then the stress levels become the anxiety levels. You're wrong with your misses over petty, stupid little things. You've got kids who want expensive trainers and expensive clothes. You want to provide for them nice holidays, nice Christmas stuff. Mm. You can't physically do that, and that's that's when the stress comes in. Uh, and the depression comes in, of course, mm. which you hear a lot now about. Uh, there's yeah. lots of help in, and lots of help out there now for mental health as well. People, it's important to talk and and to share things. Um, so one of the options is, you know, try and get something organised while you're still playing, because you get enough time away from the training ground. You only train yeah. from 10 till 11 every day. You get a day off. So, you know, there's no reason why you can't put that in place. Yeah, you, I think one of my examples is Hector Bellerin. Like, he's obviously he does a lot of studying when he's out of football because he's, he knows deep down that after once football's done yeah. for him, what's he going to have? So he needs to look to the future. And I think, yeah, big respect to him for, mm-hmm. for seeing the bigger picture with football. Um, I, I actually have a question for you. Uh, coming away from the gambling side of things, I want to know the best player you've ever played with. I want to know who maybe... I, I want to know who the best player you played with at Arsenal is, but then as a whole as well. Well, at Arsenal, it, it goes without saying it, it, it's Dennis Bergkamp. Mm. Um, they reckon if Dennis Bergkamp played in the snow, he wouldn't leave any footprints. <laughs> it just glided <laughs> yes, over, yeah. yeah. That's what he was. Um, the Ice Man. That's what yeah. He, oh. he floated, didn't he? Just mm. nice. One player. Effortless. I love effortless the guy as well. Really nice guy. Um, just, just um, very humble, very normal. But some of the things he would do with the ball at his feet on the training ground, you know, he, he would take senior pros. <laughs> Breath away, you know. Merce yeah. was magic. Merce could do anything with the football. Um, he was so t- talented, and mm. um, but even we'd be there, you know, gobsmacked at some of the goals and some of the twists and turns that yeah. could actually produce. It was like breathtaking. He was just an, a phenomenal talent, um, and I like the good lads. I, I, I'm not bothered if you can play or if you can. I just like the good lad. Dennis was a good lad. Do you know mm. what I mean? He was just one of the lads. He made himself one of the lads. Um, and, uh, no, Bergkamp. But again, at Arsenal, you know, Wrighty was... Wrighty could do everything. Mm. He could head. He could volley. He, he could leave a bit on you as well. Right? Yeah. He had a cynical mm. side to him. A little. Mm. I remember playing against... Coventry and he just he was late on Ogrizovic wasn't he big Steve Ogrizovic mm. he went mm. in late and the famous Schmeichel one as well but I, I caught the few of them off right here <laughs> chasing him all around that London Coney training ground <laughs> so, um, I, I spoke about Merce um, you know Stefan Schwartz was a really combative mm. leading midfield player loved to tackle and then I got the England back four you know they hardly conceded a goal, did they? No, no, that's it. No, barely. Martin Keown, my roommate Martin, was excellent. You know, you look at his career: England, Everton, Arsenal, Villa. Uh, great lad as well, Martin. Uh, we roomed together for a couple of years while I was there. Um, so at Arsenal, I'd have to say, and of course, when I was at Celtic, I I, I can't split Larson Burkamp. 
Really? Wow. Henrik was a, a phenomenon. Um, you know, just freakish amount of goals that mm. he scored and uh, played in World Cups, European Championships, won the Champions League at 33 or 34 with Barcelona, ended mm. up going to Manchester United after Celtic. Um, but it's just his desire and, and his attitude to the game was, was just, um, you know, we could clearly see uh, how, much it, how much it meant to him. Uh, every session, he tried to get the best out of every session. And what I liked about uh, Henrik was he, he was never really satisfied. If, like, if I played with Henrik, which I did on many a times, and I'd scored a couple of goals, and Martin O'Neill's got number 10 up and he's bringing me off. Mm. 75th minute, I'm like, ah, all right, I'm done, I'm happy with that. <laughs> mm. you know? But Henrik could be on four goals and he's chasing the goalkeeper down, the opposition goalkeeper down in his own box in the 94th minute. Yeah. yeah. And we've, we're five nil up and he's got four. And he's still, <laughs> he still wants to score five. Just want more, yeah. He just, you know, he, he's never someone to take his foot off the gas. He, he always the drive that he had and you create that yourself nobody tells you mm. to do that nobody says to do this do that or you, you know you create that drive yourself and um, so if I'm in London I say Bergkamp if I'm in Scotland I say Larson <laughs> fair enough no, no, <laughs> great, both great players <laughs> <laughs> so, so. One, one last question um, and then we'll we'll let you go on your busy day um what are your what what are your predictions for next season with the Premier League? Who do you think is going to come out on top? Oh, I tell you what, everybody thinks it's going to be between two clubs. I, I I don't see that. I don't see that. I don't think it's never as cut and dry as what you think. Um, Liverpool are phenomenal, and they twenty points they won the league by a Premier League of twenty two points, whatever it was. That is phenomenal. That's a great season. Um, of course, as well, won the won the Champions League. Um, that was brilliant for the sixth time. Um, but I think Man City will have a, they'll have an onus to, to hit mm. back. Uh, I think, um, you know, they, they'll, have a, they'll have a responsibility uh, to the owners and Pep and everything. He, second is nowhere to Pep, is it? He wants to win things. Mm, yeah. Um, you look at Chelsea, you know, you look at Frank Lampard, money to spend, some really good young players there. To add to what what he's got now, Pulisic and the likes of um, them types, um, Loftus Cheek coming back. I really mm. believe he's going to be a top player. So so disappointing for him to to have had his injury. Um, if Frank can get Chelsea into the top four, which I think he will, I think the results um, are obviously bad results against West Ham, but they bounced back and, and, and beat Palace. Um, last night so you know they'll be in the mix I don't think you can score mm. discount Chelsea no, um, you know Spurs I, I'm not sure about Spurs I'm not, I'm not sure about whether Mourinho's got it right there yet um, mm. will Harry Kane stay you don't know no. what's Harry the question, has, he got ambition, has he got ambition to go and play and maybe win the Champions League does he want to go abroad and taste a bit of Barcelona or La Liga or all these great clubs I don't know. I don't upset anybody, but um, I'm sure the Spurs fans will, will obviously want Harry to stay. But also, I put it out on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, and, and the first fans said he should go. He should yeah. go as if he's yeah. ambitious. He ain't going to win anything. No disrespect. I know they got to the Champions League final last year and got beat to Liverpool under Pochettino, but um, I, I just, I just don't think Spurs. Uh, will challenge in terms of no. title challenges. So I think it might be between Liverpool, Man City and, and Chelsea. I can't see Arsenal challenging. Can I see no. Arsenal making strides? Yeah. But I don't think they'll be strong enough to go and win the, the Premier League, you know. Um, so who else have we got? We mentioned Liverpool. Everton. City. Sorry? <laughs> Everton. I'm an Everton fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Everton, we're, uh, yeah, 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 I am. Yeah. If Tony um, Belly will ring, Tony will tell you exactly what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there's a man that I don't really want to talk to about Everton in their current state, it's probably Tony Belly. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, yeah. Yeah, no, I love no, that. Well, Tony, yeah, I, like, I liked him on the SAS program as well. I thought he was brilliant, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Fit, yeah. 
it was real raw emotion from him on that program. If I, I had two metal plates, struggling. if I had about two metal plates in my head, boys, I'd, I'd apply for that one, but I think I'll put that one. In. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't. Oh, well, I think that brings us to an end of the of the podcast. I think it's been a great one. I've enjoyed it. It's been good, yeah. You enjoyed it. Good. Good. That's what we like to hear. No, thank you so much for coming on. All right, boys. No problem. Good luck to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.